Um, sorry, one sec. It's not letting me share. I just got to do something in system preferences. Well, it's probably on my end. Let me check. No, I think you should be good to go. Um, okay, well. Yeah, record the contents of your screen until it is clear. Okay. Later. Um, okay, is this working? No. Uh, Asma, no. Uh, is Not this on my, no. no, I can't see it yet. Okay, all right, all right, sorry. One second. I'm really sorry about the technical difficulty. <laughs> okay. Like I said, this is no my first time being on this side of Zoom call, and I was not aware of all of this. Um, it's saying I got to quit really quickly and then come right back. Uh, okay. I will be right back. I'll wait for you. All right. All right. Thank you. Later. <laughs> so I'm recognizing some names Josh, Darren, Tony from the Advanced Art Book Club, Mike who's a mentor on the R for DS Slack. And then Cameron, not to put you on the spot, but would you like to introduce yes. yourself really quickly? Yeah, uh, my name is Cameron and I'm a PhD student. I'm doing a PhD in health informatics. Uh, I live in London. So it's, it's very late for me <laughs> oh. here. Uh, I don't know if you guys are gonna change this time. Uh, because I thought if it was 7.30, then yeah, that's a bit okay, but. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think we'll play around with the, with the timing. Yeah, I, I think once I'm... your other, you know, the advanced R is finished, maybe some people can then join early. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Maybe we'll move it to Tuesday. Yeah, that would be great, thank you. I mean, yeah, nice to meet you all, so. Hey, Cam. What's going on? Okay. I'm just, just seeing Cameron here. It's like just putting a face to the name. I owe you. A, I owe you a Git uh, repository video. I think. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, that would be great. Whenever you you got time, no worries. I recorded it all. I just have to edit it, and it took a few passes, so I actually have to like edit it properly. Um, so. Okay. I, okay. Yeah. How are we doing? Are, are, are we seeing everything? Great. Are we good? And we can see your screen. Yeah, screen yeah. Okay. What is algebra, right? Are we good? Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. I'm so sorry about that. Okay. So um, this is kind of a topic that's close to my heart because I was a TA in school for like a couple of math and stat classes and I had to grade papers, which I hated. And what I hated even more was when I had to dock people for points, right? And what I often found was that regardless of how like high level the class was, people screwed up their algebra. And that's where I, like, that's where people lost a lot of points, right? So there are just a lot of like common errors um, that hopefully we can just address really quickly and fix. All right. All right. So um, I'm not sure what everyone's background in math is. So just a really basic um, intro to algebra. Algebra is just this idea of you have some equation, right? like two plus three equals five. Now let's say we don't know one of these values, right? Two plus something equals five. Well, in algebra, we just throw a letter on top of it. That's it. This is algebra at its most basic, right? Like I'm not getting into linear algebra or anything like that, but it's this idea of we are using letters to represent like variables, right? We don't know what that value is, but we can figure it out. And until we do, we're just gonna call it X. Cool. I don't really like presenting, so um, this is going to be a group exercise, all right? We're going to work through this problem, okay? If you haven't done math in a little bit, it's long, but it's, I swear, it's not that bad, all right? So get out a pen and paper really quickly, if you can, and just try to work through it. Um, I, and we'll, we'll go over the answer at the end. <laughs> 
So I, I like made this random problem up mainly because it includes um, a few things that I think are important to address, right? So in this first term up here at the top, um, we're going to want to foil that, right? Because it's something plus something times something plus something, right? Or something minus something. Uh, so that's one thing we want to be aware of, making sure that we can multiply those things together properly. The second bit is just the easier part of that. If you can knock out this first part, you should be good on this second part. And same thing with the bottom part, all right? So let's initially just focus on trying to multiply this stuff out properly. All right, here's what I got, mm -hmm. at least in that first row. How are we looking? Does everyone feel comfortable with this? All right, mm -hmm. okay. So one of the tricky things here is now we've got this negative sign to deal with, right? People always screw up negative signs, myself included. Um, so I am of the opinion that like, I don't care how much paper I end up using, I will write down every step just to make sure I don't make those dumb mistakes. So we got to deal with that negative sign. So a negative times a negative is a positive, right? So we get two pluses at the end there. Good. Next up, we want to group together like terms. So at least in the top there, there's only one x squared term. That's by itself. Now I want to take all the terms with the x, put them together, and then I want to take all those constant terms without an x and put them together. That look right to everyone? Mm -hmm. Cool. Let me know if I'm zipping through this too fast. Um, lastly, we just want to add up all those like terms, right? And lo and behold, we get the same term in the numerator that we get in the denominator. So it just simpl it simplifies out to a nice simple one. Did everyone get that? Yep. Okay, cool. So yeah, that's just a bit of a warm up. I feel like this actually touches on most of like the important important stuff in algebra this is where like a lot of the mistakes are made um so i just wanted to do that really quickly like just to get everyone like sharp again right just to like be on your toes okay um i i kind of just followed the uh the topics that were laid out in the book in that chapter in the book so i'm just giving you really high level overviews right so Whenever we look at functions, I think the definition that I see the most is like a function is just a machine, right? So it takes some value, which we're going to call X, and it does something to that value, and it spits out something else, right? Spits out F of X. So it takes that value X and it transforms it somehow by some rule. That's really all a function is, right? It's just a rule. X, you see it's in that like red or pink um, oval. That's the domain. And then that value f of x that it spits out, it's in that blue oval. That is sometimes called the codomain, sometimes it's called the range. But it's basically, you take that one, that pink set, the domain, right? You uh, put it through the function, and then you get all the corresponding values. There are a few like more, um, like there's definitely a more technical um, definition of a function, but I don't think we need to go that deep. So it's really just a machine. It's a rule that does something to some value. Cool. I mean, if, if people, I guess, are more are like coming from a computer science background, then um, this probably makes a lot of sense to you too, right? It's the same deal with any one of those sorts of functions in code. So the book um, mentioned a few functions that were important to, to remember. So these first two functions over here, min and max, right? So min of x comma a, at least the way I learned it, was it's really just saying choose the minimum of these two. Once you figure out what those values are, just pick the smaller one, right? And the same thing for max, except instead of choose the smaller value, choose the larger value. So it's, it's just kind of like shorthand notation. That's really all it is. And then that second function, so it's in the book, they just use those square brackets and then they have some sort of condition like um, like x is equal to three or something like that, right? Or x is greater than one. 
this is called an indicator variable. And all it says is if that specified condition within those square brackets is met, then the value of this variable is one. If not, it's zero, right? So again, it's just shorthand. Mathematicians and statisticians are kind of lazy. So we just try to get it, this concept out as quickly as we can. Does that make sense to everyone? Is that clear? Hey, Adam, super, yeah. probably mm -hmm. super obvious answer here, but inside min, what is X and what is A? So they are, we don't, um, they're just two values, right? Like sometimes um, X is defined by some other function and we don't really know what X is at, like when we, when we write out this equation, we don't know what X is, but we know, like let's say that A is some constant, right? So we're gonna pick like the smaller value between some value that we're gonna compute later on and zero. And that's the one that we're gonna go with. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it, it doesn't, uh, it might not, we not, we might not know it at the time of writing min X or A, right? But it's something that we should be able to figure out at some point. Cool. Yeah. Just, just bringing it back into R, like I, I sometimes use these and what I usually do is I do min and then the data frame name dollar sign like the variable and then it spits out the minimum or the maximum of that yeah. so I was wondering what that comma was and how it was used okay so I so um I've never seen it used with like multiple commas I guess if you know what I mean like I've, I've never seen it used like min x1 comma x2 comma x3 just pick the smallest value but mm. it if, if you imagine that like that column in your data frame is just a vector, right? Of X of one, X of two, X of three. All you're doing is you're like iteratively running this min function on it, right? You're doing what's the minimum of X one and X two. Well then what's the minimum between that minimum and X three and so on until you find that minimum value within that entire vector. Okay, did cool, that, I'll try that out. Did that like make it more complicated? <laughs> No, no, I think, I think I see it. I'll, okay. I'll try it in the R console and see what happens. Yeah, but yeah, so all, all this is really saying is just of these two values, what's the smaller one, right? Like cool. I could have put min x, um, min x, y, or min a comma b. Uh, I just stuck with x and a because that's what was in the book, right? Asma, I'm wondering, are you um, seeing those functions as like our functions with arguments being passed as opposed to just two values? Yeah, that's, that's how I'm seeing it. But um, <laughs> I'm probably trying to relate it back into R like too soon. This is just like a demonstration of, of how, how it works. Yeah, I think, right, I think it's just lower level than that. It's not, it's not really arguments, it's just two values. I don't know mm -hmm. why X and A, I think A and B would make it more like intuitive that you're just comparing two values. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. I'll change that. No, 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 it doesn't need to <laughs> change that though. No, thank you. Okay. And that's how and then, uh, the book, I did, I'm sorry, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, yeah, that's how it was in the book. It was X and A and I was looking at it and I'm saying, saying, okay, what argument does X mean? Oh no, he's just, he's just using two values. Gotcha. Yeah. Cool. Is there an answer? Or, okay, all right. Um, then we're good with the indicator variable. All right. That's like an if else, if you want to go back to R, right? It's like, if this, then X is equal to zero, or then X is equal to one. If not, X is equal to zero. Is that clear? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Powers and logarithms. Um, I didn't want to just write down all the rules because they're like kind of detailed out. And there are plenty of little cheat sheets where you could use them. So I just want to show, um, I just want to describe them, I guess, right? So when you say x to the n or x to the nth power, all you're saying is if I take this value x and multiply it by itself n times, what number do I get, right? So x squared is just x times x. It's x multiplied by itself twice. Now the root or the nth root is kind of, is like kind of the inverse of that, right? So it's saying, given that I have this number x, what number do I have to multiply by itself n times in order to get x, right? So 
they just kind of they interrelate in that way is that okay i feel like these two aren't aren't too bad it's the logarithms that always screws people up myself included okay so in the same or like similar to how the the nth root signifies um, what number when multiplied by itself n times gives me x the logarithm says given some number how many times do i have to multiply it by itself in order to get x right so like i'm specifying some base b and i also have this other value x in mind and i want to know how many times do i have to take b and multiply it by itself in order to get x that's what the logarithm function is saying um I like ridiculous examples because those are the ones that I remember. Um, so, <laughs> I've, has anyone ever heard of a rapper named Exhibit? Right? Or there's this old show called Pimp My Ride where this rapper would, it was like on MTV, ancient show, but basically this rapper would go and like find these, um, find these people whose cars were just in terrible shape, right? And he would take it. Um, take it to this body shop and they would customize it and do all these kinds of absurd things like they'd be like you know i heard you like fish so we put an aquarium in your trunk like all kinds of weird stuff like that right so this, this rapper his name was exhibit spelled x z right and he, he used to always say on the show he called himself x to the z right so the way I always remember this is I go log base x, y equals z, right? X, y, z, nice and ordered out, easy to remember. And then I think of exhibit and I go x to the z is equal to y. That's kind of like the way that I always, I always remember this whenever I forget about this rule. It's stupid and weird, but it's worked ever since high school, so I'm sticking with it, all right? And I hope, I hope this is something that sticks in your guys' brains, too. Um, any questions here? Mm. Any comments? Nothing? Okay, cool. That's actually pretty funny. <laughs> I, <Yeah. laughs> I'm going to remember like that. Yeah, I don't know why. This, this was the one that just came to me. I think I was like panicking on an exam when, when this one came to me and, I was, and ever since then, it's, it's been my rock. <laughs> okay, um, we've already kind of looked at polynomials back in that first example. But polynomials are just equations that take this sort of form, right? Where you have, um, you have a bunch of terms and each one of them has an X factor, right? It has that variable factor, and that factor is raised to some exponent or, or some, but uh, I guess in order technically for it to be a polynomial, that exponent has to be a whole number. So zero through infinity, right? Zero, one, two, three, four, all the way up to infinity, right? So um, really the, the most important thing to note here is just this guy right here. So this entire term, it's called the leading term, right? It's the term with like the biggest um, exponent on the x, right? And this term that I square, or that I put in a square right here, this is called the degree of the polynomial. So if let's say we had another term on here that was like e x to the 500th, then that would be the leading term of this polynomial. And the degree of this term, or the degree of this polynomial would be 500, right? So I think in the book, they briefly mentioned like linear equations, quadratic equations, things like that. All those equations are, are they're just polynomials where the degree of the polynomial, which again is the exponent of the leading term, right? Like that highest ranking term. Um, all those are, are just other ways of um, like describing this term, right? So if this leading term, if this exponent was just the one so like if we just got rid of this part of the equation and we only used these two terms then this would be a linear equation right because this exponent right up here would be a one now let's say we used all three of these terms now the leading um now the degree of this polynomial is two so this becomes a quadratic equation 
And then if we include this, it becomes a cubic, then quartic, and it just keeps going on and on and on. Um, but that's really, I think, like the big takeaway from polynomials is just we want to kind of focus on this guy right here. That's the degree of the polynomial. OK. And lastly, um, I didn't create a graphic for this. I just shamelessly stole one um, from the internet, and I will credit it later on. So in statistics, um, we, all, we have like data points, right? Like I am a data point and I'm represented by a bunch of numbers. I have an age, I have a height, I have a weight, I have all these other things, right? So typically we represent like our, our, observ or our units, I guess. We represent them with um, vectors, right? We represent them with like, with a bunch of numbers that we like in a data frame, right? So, the dot product is an operation that you just, that um, is applied to two vectors. And all it is, is we take the corresponding element of each vector and just multiply them together. And then we sum all of that, which this graphic is missing, I just realized. So I will fix that and add that on, right? So the dot product of these two vectors here is gonna be two times eight plus seven times two plus one times eight. So the dot product, um, sometimes called the inner product, because um, that's another way of kind of representing the vectors, um, is really, it's a way of going from an n-dimensional vector space down to one, right? So we're taking these vectors, in this case, they're each um, vectors of three dimensions, but it, the, the dot product of any two vectors is always gonna be, um, a scalar of some sort. So it's always going to be of that within one dimension. I feel like I just jumped from like, kind of like simple, simple things. And all of a sudden I start talking about dimensions and all kinds of weird stuff like that. So if anything there wasn't clear, um, let me know. But that's, that's really all I had. And I'm sorry about the, uh, the delays. Yeah. Uh, uh, in um, those vectors, can you have uh, unknowns? No. Uh, well, yeah, like you could have an X in there, right? And then, but then you'd have to handle that at some point later on. So like um, a dot product could also be represented as, if, if let's just say we called this first one on the left, X, right? And then each element in X would be like X sub one, X sub two, X sub three. And then this guy on the right, we'll call that Y. Y sub one, Y sub two, Y sub three. So yeah, they could, they could actually absolutely be unknowns. I take it back. <laughs> yeah, they can absolutely be unknowns. And then, um, so the dot product of those two vectors would be like x1, y1, plus x2, y2, plus x3, y3. Good question. Any other questions, guys? Not really a question, but it's kind of amazing once you start programming, like how much this kind of stuff can be abstracted. You just multiply one vector by another and you don't even really think about it sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's kind of the beauty of R, right? Is they ju it just does all this magic behind the scenes that you don't really worry about. <laughs> cool. Um, that's, that's all I have for you guys. Um, if you have any questions or if you think of anything I missed or if you see any mistakes in here, please let me know. I'll fix them up. And then, um, Asma, do we have like a GitHub or something that I should be putting all these things yes, up on? Yes, we do. I'll be sending you a link on how to upload your slides. Okay. And I'll take care of the rest in terms of putting the presentation on YouTube. Okay, cool. So right, usually well. when we have some time left over, we usually crank up the good old R and try to do, the, do things in there. So I was wondering if you knew how to set up a dot product in the how R console. How to set up a dot product? Yeah, I think I do. But let me open up R. Did, should I still be sharing? Screen sharing? Mm-hmm, sure. Okay. And 
Sorry, let me close this current project before I get this on the screen. Also, while I have everyone here still, so for the later chapters, Frank does a good job of using data sets that come with certain packages. But if we had wanted, we could pick a data set that we could use for examples and for illustrative purposes. So I was thinking of the penguins data set. There's other really good ones for stats. But let me know if you have any other suggestions. And if you don't, I, I recommend that we use that moving forward wherever we can. It's, it's not like a hard requirement, but if, if you do want to apply some concepts to a data set, I think that's a good one. Uh, I have never used the Penguin data set. Can you briefly describe what, what, what it has? Yeah, I can, once Adam is done, I could pull up the page for it and we could go over it together. Does that sound okay? From my understanding, it's just, it's, it's kind of like the Iris data set. It's like a toy data set in that regard um, with like three or four features, except it's not, like, I, I think Iris has some, has some like a shady history behind it. Whereas this one is just like happy penguins. It's chill. So. <laughs> Okay. That was okay, that was my impression that it, it's now replacing iris as the go-to biological, uh, well, not biological, but what e ecological data set. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, it's not replacing in terms of default. It's just just best practice. I think is what's changed. Kind of amazing how like, the entire community got around that, that idea. It's like now it's. It's all anybody uses, and I mean, it's still fresh, so it feels nice. Maybe like 10 years from now, we might want to put some more on so that it works. Oh, I guess just another, um, like a quick addendum, I guess, to, to my presentation. Um, so there are, there are like a lot of, um, shortcuts, I guess, when you're dealing with like exponents and logarithms and things like that. Um, my advice is if you're ever not sure, just make a little toy example, right? Like, uh, yeah, just like throw a couple numbers in there and double check that your rule or whatever you think that rule is that you memorize works out. And in addition to that, try not to use two like the number two whenever you're doing those little guess and checks because two plus two equals four two times two equals four two squared equals four you can get into a whole lot of trouble if you just use twos so try to switch it up and use like bigger numbers it might be a little bit of a headache but you'll you you'll probably get it right <laughs> okay adam do you mind just making things a little bigger just like command sure. plus i think Thank yeah. you. How's that? Is that too big? That's great. Yeah. Okay. So that might be a little too big. Too big. Okay. That's good. Yeah. How's no, that? no, it's fine. <laughs> Where are we at? All right. I'm sorry. <laughs> Is that good? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, if I remember right, so dot product is just kind of built into R. I think it might be that. Um, so it kind of, it, it, it just like handles it behind the scenes, I guess. I can, do you want me to go into like a little bit more detail? I wasn't, I wasn't really prepared for this part of it. So. No, no, I was just, no, I, I was, no, no worries. Like we usually, so the book club is, is not so you can walk in as like the expert and teach all of us. Although if you are amazing, it's more like we kind of try to figure things out together. Okay. So okay. it looks like, did you, how did you find that dot product annotation? You just looked at mathematical annotation in R. That's what I'm seeing your help page. Oh no, I had, um, I just looked up dot because I wasn't sure if there was like a function called dot in here as well. Um, but I knew this just from like a previous class that I had taken. So I think I had okay, done cool. some stuff doing that. 
I, I think for this particular example, if you just do X multiply by Y, it should give you the answer. Right? Because that's just how vectors work. No, so I think X yeah. multiplied by Y does that first part. So the part that my incomplete graphic and my slides has is, is, uh, is, I guess, what, what X times Y does here. Okay. But, but this is we, could, we could kind of supplement that, right? Because I think that would do it. Okay. It's, it's interesting to me that uh, doing it the longer way gives you a, a single value, but the other one gives you a matrix. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, I don't want to say I misspoke, but um, I think that's kind of like a bit of a philosophical thing with this. If you approach dot product from, um, from the angle of like, you're just multiplying two vectors, right? You're multiplying them and summing them. So kind of like that, that definition of the term dot product, then you get a scalar value. But it's the dot product is also known as the inner product and the inner product is um, it's actually the product of two different um, matrices, right? So that first matrices is going to be one row by N columns. And then that's or that first matrix is going to be one row by N columns. And then the second matrix is going to be um, N rows by one column. And if you like with matrix multiplication, it's, that ends up collapsing down to a matrix that is one by one, right? So that's, so I think when we use um, this notation over here, it's treating them as matrices. So you're getting this one by one matrix. Whereas over here, we're kind of using more of that, that, uh, that like extended dot product way of going about it. But yeah, from, from what I know about R, um, that's something it, it, tr it tries to do is, is um, use those like matrix sort of computations. It keeps things moving a lot faster. So I think if we like, I'm not sure, I didn't look too far ahead within the book, but I think when we get into things like linear regression, um, it's, it's just a whole lot of matrix multiplication, right? Like that's really what's going on underneath the hood. Anything else that you guys want to check out? <laughs> I guess like we could go back to Osmo's example, right? So I'd be curious to see. So you could say min of, you could just say min of like one and two, right? Like what does that spit out? One, right? What about min of X? You get one again. I just out of curiosity, what if we throw two vectors in? What happens there? Okay, so I'm guessing it's just concatenating everything into one vector and finding the minimum. But yeah, so I think I guess going back going back to your question, Asma, I think like in at least in in like the books or literature that I've seen, I've never seen that min function with more than two terms in it, but I don't see why it couldn't be that. Mm -hmm. Or we could try it right now with three terms. Yeah. Three vectors, I should say. Okay. So oh, let's like all right. So Yeah, it looks like it just concat concatenates all of them and just finds. What the if you throw an NA in one of the vectors? What happens? Oh, okay. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Okay, not the minimum value. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm um, tan, tan brought up in the chat. 
Yeah, I'm always having to do NA RM equals true. I do range a lot to just sort of find the range of like a, a column. Mm -hmm. And if there's like an NA in one of them, it just, it won't work. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Because R understands it as, it could be anything. It could be less, it could be more, it could be any of them. So is it a true <laughs> minimum? It could even be a minus two, you know, like you, you, you don't know what it could be. So you have to explicitly remove it. Otherwise it's, it's sort of just like programming default. I guess like even the fact that it spits out NA is a bit of a warning in itself when you're like, all right, I'm looking for a number. That's clearly not one. I should probably double check what's going on here. Uh, Adam, can you do a dot product of more than two vectors at one time? Within R, I'm not sure. I don't. So do you mean something like X? Well, I should probably fix Z real quick. Right? But do you mean something like? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Um, okay. Y so is it, is it determining the scalar of x dot y and then applying that to z? That's okay. So it looks like, so let's just see. So if we were to just run this bit, right? Mm -hmm. So that works. We get 32. And yeah, it looks like it's just taking 32. So it's taking that, that scalar value. And I guess a scalar times a vector, even with this notation, just takes that scalar value and multiplies it by every element within the vector. Well, okay. So, so you, can, you can do it, but what you get is not a scalar, you get a vector. Right. Well, it's not that, it's doing matrix multiplication. Right? So, so yeah. A constant by a matrix, you know. Yeah. Be, right? So. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So, it's considering that a constant and then it's just multiplying it by that vector. Or, yeah. So, matrix. Yeah. I get what you're saying, Darren. What if you change the brackets to be um, on Y and Z? Um, before I run it, what do you guys think is going to happen? I think it's going to condense Y, Z to a scalar and then multiply it then. I yeah. Yeah, it's the other dimension, right? Yeah. It's good enough. Okay, so help me out. Why does it return? Uh, a single row in one case and a single column in a, uh, the other. Yeah. Is, is, it, is it the order? Is it because of the order of the art of the, uh, the two? Um, yeah. So I think, I think it is because of the order. Um, so I haven't done this in a while, but if I remember right, R like, so matrix multiplication is all about having matching dimensions, right? You have to match in, um, in like those inner dimensions, right? So I think R kind of gets rid of that safety net and it doesn't like warn you if those, if those um, dimensions don't match. I think it just, if you get that wrong in your order, I think it'll just flip it until and see if that works. Right. I, we can give that a go. Oh. Go ahead. Who was that? Uh, yeah. So if you multiply an M by N matrix by an N by something else matrix, you'll get M by something else. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, M by N times M. So, all right. right. Maybe, maybe I should type it. But, um, but the answer is, um, what is the answer? Is, is that, Okay, so why? So this is the transpose, right? Sorry, I, I, I don't want to get too much math. <laughs> but, but, all right, so if you multiply an M by N matrix by an M by B matrix, 
And you get an M by P matrix. Right. You get M by P, right? Yeah. So here we have, except for, right. So, so in this case, you had a, all right, so you, what do we have here? The first one is X, X is what size? What, what, what's the dim of X? Three. But, it, it, but it's like three by one, or is it? I think it's, I think right? it's one by uh, three. It's one by three, right? So yeah. it's one row, three columns, right? Yeah. So, so X is one by three, Y is one by three, and Z is one by three, right? Okay. So you have one by three times, well, I guess Y by, Y dot Z gives you a one by one matrix, yeah, right? right? So the dot is gonna give you a one by one. Okay, so well, hmm. The dot is giving you a one by one. Adam, yeah. In your, in your example, could you try x dot three and then three dot x and see if they return? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So I wonder if I would that work. No, no, no. They're non-conformable in that way, but I could totally, I'm pretty sure I could just do that. And that gives me something, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it gives you a vector and not a matrix. I think the, the thing that's, that's tripping me up is thinking in, in matrix structure. Yeah. Yeah. So how is it handling that? It's treating it one by ones as constants. But I think you can actually do it the other way though. What's so that? like do three make dot product X. Yeah. Yeah. But not the other way because like three has one dimension in both um, number of rows and number of columns. Yeah. And then X only has one dimension in its rows, I think. So it's throwing the vectors as a one by three then, right? Like three yeah. is a one by one and then X is a one by three. And then we get a one by three. Which is why you could, M, I think, M multiplying it. Yeah, so I guess the real question is, why does the, why do the two one by threes multiply? Why did you think? Yeah. Why, why does a one by three conform with a one by three? I wonder if it flips the flips the thing around just so that it can get the one by three times three by one times one by three. I wonder if it does it implicitly. It seems so because I mean, the answer is coming out. So yeah, but, um, you know, so it 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 you know I don't yeah there probably just maybe is some if statement and it could saying, you know, if there's a, although, but. Okay, so here I'm looking up, so there's a function in R called that. Well, right, so it multiplies two matrices and if they are, if they are conformable. If one argument is a vector, it will be promoted to either a row or column matrix to make the two arguments conformable. Right, if both even... vectors are of the same length, it will return the inner product as a matrix. Okay. Yeah. So it looks like what it's, so it's initial, if they're just two vectors of the same length, it'll just, it call, I, yeah. And, and mm -hmm. this is a shortcut for that function. So if they're two vectors of the same length, it's just going to go with the inner product. Um, and if there's potential for the two to work, right? Like even if we don't order it properly, I guess, if there is potential for it to work, it'll make that happen too. I guess it really only gives you an error yeah. when it can't. Right. I think if you define the dimensions of the objects, then it, it can cause an error, but in this case, the dimensions are not set, right? Because you have vectors. 
okay. so it will conform them to the dimensions that are required. Because if you try um, as matrix of x, uh, dot product of as matrix of y, you've now defined the definite and it will cause an error. Thanks. Okay, makes sense. Okay, cool. Thanks, Adam. I'm going to stop the recording here.